Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Wherever you're tuning in from around the world, welcome to the Conscious Consultant Hour Awakening Humanity. I am very, very pleased that you are all here with me today. We've got a wonderful show in store for you with an amazing guest who I had on once before, but there were some technical difficulties, so we didn't quite get him on for the full show. So I'm very pleased to, to have him back again today. But before I bring on my guest, um, let me just uh, quickly go through uh, my little section of my book, Everyday Awakening. Um, and this little section is entitled, uh, To Heal Our Deepest Wounds, We Must Speak the Truth About Our Pain. In order to begin a healing process, there is something we must be willing to do. It is not just about taking better care of ourselves or changing our lifestyle. It is about something far deeper and far more difficult. To start a journey to wholeness, we must be willing to speak our truth. This is the truth about how we feel deep inside, the truth about our pain and suffering. The truth about our desires and secret wishes, without admitting to ourselves that we are experiencing, feeling, and truly want to have happen now, we cannot move forward. What we hide inside of us will continue to control us. What we shun and fear will continue to affect our life. The truth we deny will fester and grow until it comes out. It is not easy to admit the truth to ourselves. It takes courage to be brutally honest about how we feel and what we want. Yet we do it not for ourselves, but for others, so that we may be whole again and at peace. Oh, yet we do it not for others, but for ourselves, so that we may be whole again, not at peace. Reverse that, didn't I? It is only by shining the light of our own truth into the blackest corners of our soul that we free ourselves from the shackles of the deepest wounds that stay with us our whole lives. These are the wounds that kill us if we do not address them. These are the wounds that drive us if we do not speak them out loud. What is your truth that you have been afraid to speak? What pain is there in there that needs to come out? So this section of my book, um, I wrote uh, after um, seeing a movie that that one of my teachers recommended. And, it, and it's ostensibly a movie based on a kid's book called A Monster Calls. And it's a wonderful, wonderful movie. I highly recommend it about a boy who's who's going through a very difficult time in his life because his mother has cancer. And uh, Liam Neeson plays the voice of, of the monster, which is like this giant tree that comes and visits him and tries to, to sort of teach him about life. But the end of the movie, it's, it's really brilliant. I don't want to spoil it for you, but it really comes down to speaking, the boy learning to speak his truth. And this is something that at the time had such a deep impact on me to really see how we all have these deep pains, these deep um, um, challenges within us uh, that we're afraid to admit, that we're afraid to sort of speak out loud. Yet until we do, they actually control us in an unconscious way. The, the, these truths cause us to make little decisions that make a big impact on our life. But it's only by recognizing these truths, admitting them, speaking them out loud, or speaking them to ourselves, and just admitting them that we begin to heal from it, that we bring light to it, consciousness to it, that we bring more awareness to it so that these dark truths don't continue to troll, control us to the rest of our lives. Um, so if you haven't seen the movie yet, definitely check it out. I know it's on Netflix. It's probably other places as well. A Monster Calls. It, it's a wonderful story for kids of all ages. It's actually a very adult movie. Um, but the message in it is really amazing and, and that's what inspired this section of my book um again that's entitled to heal our deepest wounds we, we must speak the truth about our pain so uh 
your assignment this week is uh, to see what truth uh, are you not speaking um, that's a painful truth that will help you to heal if you let it out. Um, so that's from my book, Everyday Awakening. Hope you have a chance to uh, uh, take a listen to it. And now it is my extreme pleasure to welcome back to the show, Daniel Pinchbeck. Daniel is the best-selling author of several wonderful books, including How Soon Is Now, Afterlife, Is There Consciousness After Death, When Plants Dream, Breaking Open the Head, and 2012, The Return of Quetzalcoatl. Um, he's the co-founder of the web magazine Reality Sandwich and the online event platform Evolver.net. His essays and articles have appeared in a vast range of publications, including the New York Times, Esquire, Rolling Stones, Art Forum, and he's been a columnist for Dazed and Confused. And it is my pleasure to welcome someone I consider to be a very deep thinker um, onto the show. W welcome, Daniel. Uh, thank you, Sam. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure. I've I've been... You know, even from before I had you on the show, I'd met you a long, long time ago at an Evolver meeting down in the village. I, I think we were talking about alternative currencies at the time. And I've been following you since then. I've been subscribed to your blog. And so much of what you write about and talk about really resonates with me and rings a chord. And, and so there are a few things that I really wanted to touch upon uh, on the show with you. And I would like to start with the, the ecological crisis that we're facing and humanity's apparent lack of response to it. And, and it's really, it's something that it is, is kind of mind boggling that this is a, a real major world crisis yet we don't seem to really be taking it seriously, do we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, it's yeah, it's it's you know, we're. I, mean, I don't. It's such a big question. I'm not quite sure how to how to how to dig in. But I mean, um, uh, I mean, yeah. Now the, even the head of the UN is warning that there may be a global, uh, you know, food crisis uh, next year. You know. Oh, next uh, year already. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, well, you know, we're, we're ideological creatures and we are embedded in, uh, ideologies that have functioned well for the last, you know, few centuries, uh, the idea of progress, technology as the savior, uh, capitalism as constantly creating like growth and opportunity. And, um, it's not that easy for people to realize that, um, some of this ideology is now proving to be, to be false or, or wrong or misguided and that actually um we would have to move into a different kind of um system to uh avert the uh the consequences of our of our uh, actions yeah. um so yeah i mean um i think that's part of the problem we don't you know on one hand there's ideology on the other hand there's like systems and structures because even for those people who wake up to it what do you do i mean you know your individual actions seem kind of hopeless. Like you could stop eating meat, you could, you know, do a little composting, um, but uh, that's not going to make a big difference, you know. Um, so yeah, we we don't really have systems systemic support for the types of changes that would be necessary, or kind of like uh, we don't even get kind of um, societal approval for like you know doing things that that would be of value. Um, so the support structures aren't there and our ideology is, is still trapped in uh, older ways of uh, seeing our situation, uh, like this idea of uh, expecting technolog technological solutions and progress. Right. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the actual solutions, I mean, you can read like Bill Gates's book on the climate crisis or whatever, but uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the actual solutions would require changes in lifestyle on a, on a, on a mass scale and doing things like... Um, shifting from industrial farming, you know, reducing the amount of animal farming uh, drastically, but also shifting to more like permaculture and organic farming practices, uh, traveling less, uh, you know, bicycling more, mm -hmm. uh, insulating houses. I mean, a lot of it's not very glamorous. It's not what people want to hear about. They want to hear about, um, you know, the, what's, you know the, the faster, cooler, you know, next thing. Uh, the idea that actually we have to slow down and go backwards for, for, our, for our survival uh is um nobody's selling that 
You know, it's, right. not what, it's not what, you know, it's not what's being sold in the Super Bowl ads or whatever, you know, so that's, that's part of the problem. Right. It, 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 it it's kind of like this, the, this unwillingness to recognize the lack of sustainability of the type of society that we've created and that the, the solution to it is something that nobody wants to admit to. Um, and, and it, and I, I feel like it, it's even, and, and as you mentioned, it's it's bigger than just what we can do individually. And and somebody said to me, and I don't really know if this is true or not, that like 70% of the pollution is being generated by like 10 mega corporations, like energy companies, you know, we're still burning fossil fuels, factories and mills, you know, there's still like these major industrial complexes that are continuing to spew into the atmosphere stuff that we know for a fact is bad for the environment, is bad for the climate, yet it, it's, I, I mean, I don't know. It, it, is it individuals? Is it corporations? I, don't, I, don't, I can't really see that it makes sense to, you know, single out, in a way it doesn't even make sense to single out the corporations because yeah. they're just responding to, you know, pressure from shareholder on the one hand, but also what consumers want. Right. I mean, we all want, you know, we all want uh, the new thing, you know, these things are made of, you know, rare materials and rare minerals that have to be mined in places like uh, the Congo and so on. Um, you know, our grandparents or parents' pension funds are tied up, you know, in, in, in those in those corporations. So it's um, it's really systemic. I mean, I wrote a book called How Soon Is Now, mm -hmm. which was a sort of a um, consolidation of like 10 years of reading and, and researching and thinking about the situation. And um, in that book, I kind of argued that we'd have to look at this, you know, sort of three different main areas, like just to get a handle on a very abstract level, which is like, you know, social systems, like political economic system, you know, technical infrastructure, things like energy and agriculture and transport and um, waste management, and then sort of consciousness, ideology, you know, indoctrination through media and so on. And we'd have to step back and be like, okay, like we kind of need to like, you know, in the same way, when a computer system gets too old, you have to do an upgrade. You know, you have a new, you have to install like a new system software right. um, to actually deal in reality with the situation that we've created on the planet. We actually need a new like a uh, system upgrade. And um, so all this talk about like green capitalism or, you know, the 1.5 degree, you know, uh, warming and so on. I mean, none of that's even conceivable uh, until we really, you know, rethink our economic system, for instance, and, right. you know, the, the kind of technologies that, um, you know, need to be supported. I mean, because we have an economic system that's based on, um, you know, publicly traded companies have to maximize uh, profit shareholder value. So they have to go for short term financial gain. So for instance, Apple, you know, is constantly changing even just like the power cords that you have to plug into. Um, you know, so they do that because every time they do that, they make 50 bucks per cord. Mm -hmm. Everybody buys, you know, 10, 10 trillion cords, but it's totally unsustainable. That's just creating more plastic. Yeah. Cords, you know, so we have we have a, a waste intensive system that basically conspicuous consumption and planned obsolescence. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and all all it's doing is is like you said, creating more waste, more toxicity, making things more and more unsustainable. Um, I want to get into a little bit more of this idea of that we need a a consciousness shift, but we got to take just a little quick break. And so when we come back, um, let's talk about that and talk about what, uh, um, as, uh, as we both know, that there are certain tools to help us with shifting consciousness and maybe what roles do those have to play um, in the potential future that we have. So everyone, please stay tuned. You're listening to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. I see loyal listeners, William and Patty, uh, on the YouTube live. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we'll be right back with our guest, Daniel Pinchbeck, in just a moment. Are you a business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy. And I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? 
I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant, and on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you on edge? Hey, we live in challenging, edgy times, so let's lean in. I'm Sandra Bargeman, the host of The Edge of Every Day, which airs each Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Tune in live with me and my friends and colleagues as we share stories and perspectives about pushing boundaries and exploring our rough edges. That's The Edge of Every Day on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Welcome back to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. So we're speaking this hour with author Daniel Pinchbeck. So Daniel, we're in this situation, as we've talked about, where there really needs to be a shift in in just how we live, in our awareness, in our consciousness. Okay, I mean, there doesn't need to be anything. Oh, okay. (laughs) Well, if we would like to survive as a species, let's use that qualifier. Okay. Um, And... And 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 as you said, there, there's like, in in order for us to sort of change the systems, to change the way we're living, then it it, it, it was kind of like upgrading our computer. There needs to be an upgrade in consciousness to be able to fully make that shift, to fully embody it. And um, you've been involved in the psychedelic industry for many years. I, I was recently at the Horizons conference. And, and had an opportunity to, to hear about, you know, what's kind of the latest stuff going on in the industry. Colorado just uh, legalized psilocybin after Oregon did. There are a lot of concerns in the industry, but um, how can psychedelics um, help us to move forward? Is it a way or, or, or is it not really something that's going to make a big enough impact? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, um... Obviously, we're seeing, among other problems, like a huge mental health crisis, uh, you know, massive upsurge in like depression, anxiety, and so on. And, um, you know, obviously, at the root of a lot of that anxiety and depression is fear of death. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, psychedelics, you know, can help people address their fundamental uh, fears uh, and also give them a sense that there are uh, more possibilities within consciousness, more dimensions of consciousness exploration, uh, which can make them happier, mm-hmm. um, I believe. But uh, they're also very powerful tools and they're also easy to misuse. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I, my first book, Breaking Open the Head, was all about psychedelic shamanism and I've written about it a lot. Uh, I wrote about ayahuasca recently in another book called When Plants Dream, like a sort of cultural bio- biography in a way of ayahuasca. So I do see great utility and potential in these substances. But for me, the, the, the mental health aspect, which is what Horizons, what the sort of industry has focused on, is, is you know, one important aspect of it. But there's other pieces of the puzzle too, uh, which is you know, if it could help people to really reach almost like a different um, understanding of uh, you know our our possibilities as a species, you know what 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 consciousness is, uh, and so on. You know, I mean, I remember the first time I took mushrooms, I I had this experience of feeling like very connected to the natural world, and watching people use money was so strange. Like, how, why are we valuing this sort of uh, these dirty bits of paper so much, and why are people so disconnected from the present moment? Why do they all seem mm. to be like 
fixated on like what's in the past or the future. I guess in a way it was like a very power of now, you know, kind of insight, but before, before totally. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot they can do, but by themselves, they're not going to do the job. Uh, and actually, if you look at how indigenous cultures use um, visionary plants and, and so on, they're tools for initiation, but then also it's very important that the elders of the community hold space for the process that the younger people are going through and yeah. also kind of uh, help take their visions and kind of weave them back into the narrative of, of, the, of the community over time, um, you know, kind of... Um, so yeah, so, I th so I'm a little concerned about how a lot of the psychedelic kind of um, movement is kind of being sort of pulled back into capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, where psychedelics are being seen as tools for um, kind of if you're an entrepreneur, you can get more creative ideas for how to run your business, or if you're um, you know an overworked Google executive, you can you know become more mindful and at peace. So, uh, but hopefully it's just a step in a deeper process and it is great that um, they're becoming more accepted culturally again. One of the things though that I noticed is in, in, not always, but in general, when people use psychedelics, they tend to feel more connected to the environment, more connected to nature around them. And now they're more mindful about our impact on the planet. And it does seem to create a, a more a holistic perspective you know not, not necessarily about everything or or always but but there is a tendency to sort of move in that direction yeah i totally agree with you that's a good that's a that's a great positive good good point i should have i should have mentioned that yeah but but i think what you brought up about the elders is so important because so many people think like oh i can just get some mushrooms and and trip on my own and without sort of guidance without an elder without um someone who was there to hold the space then it's 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 a recreational maybe a celebratory experience but it's not necessarily a, a deep spiritual experience or it's not something that can help to inform and shape and and help the person to change their life is it not as much well it still could be but um yeah. um yeah i mean i mean I, I wrote about this in break up in the head and other books but it's sort of like um you know, to have a to have a voyage of an initiation succeed, the end point of that initiation is the reintegration into the community, um, and other, otherwise people just end up, you know, isolated in in their um, realizations. You know, right, right, and and to to me, it just it 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 highlights the need for like an integration process that you know so many people because it's hip and fad going down to Peru. Or going down to South America somewhere doing ayahuasca and they come back and there's no support. They're back in the exact same environment they left in yeah. and they're not necessarily have the support to make the fundamental changes in their life that they need to. Yeah. Although, although, you know, having said that there is a huge new kind of, uh, you know, career path for integration counselors, you know, mm -hmm. I, know I know many people who are doing that with psychedelics. Yes. So, yes. Um, so it's, uh, that, that is happening to some extent. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, <laughs> you know, psychedelics are looking as a tool to sort of change people's consciousness around sort of the way we live. And um, one of the things is like there are viable alternative methods to how society is structured. I think sometimes we get a little too stuck in like, well, what else is there? Like, you know, we think because capitalism is what's dominant right now, like that's all there is. But but there are examples of other ways of living that are successful that that we could adopt, right? Yeah, I mean, there are. But and, and you know, even within what's called capitalism, there's different flavors. I mean, if you go to like, um, I was just in you know, Europe for a couple of months. I was in Paris and I was in Norway and so on. You know, you have a feeling of a more sort of caring society than you find in the U.S. Um, and you know they do that by you know progressive taxation, so that um, you know they're, they're, you know particularly in the Scandinavia, you know there's this idea that um, people aren't supposed to be like so much better than everybody else. You know, mm. I think that's actually very healthy, and and our model is is very unhealthy. Just coming, I flew back to JFK yesterday, and just like I was just shocked by how ugly the airport is, and how like the uh. escalator doesn't work, and 
nothing works. And it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, there's no sense of like cultural pride, you know, all the mm. money that, you know, I mean, America is supposed to be the richest country in the world, or it was, oh, you yeah. know, all, all the money that we could have used to really create a beautiful infrastructure and a social network has all been siphoned off by uh, the rich people, you know, by, no. the, by the banking elite, mm. uh, you know, and, and, you know, right now I just wrote a piece about Sam Bankman Fried and the FTX collapse. Right. And, you know, he was basically doing what Wall Street does, like BlackRock, you know, uh, Sequoia, these big, cap, you know, these big capital investment firms were totally behind what he was doing, which was clearly and openly stated a Ponzi scheme, you know, mm. Um so, um, so yeah, so I mean, we could certainly be doing better even within capitalism, but then beyond that, yeah, if you look at something like, uh, you know, the, you know, different natural Native American uh, ways of organizing society, uh, like I, in how soon as now I looked at a book by an anthropologist, uh, Pierre Klaus, a society against the state, uh, where he talked about how a lot of these indigenous societies were actually organized, designed so that hierarchical relationships of power and domination could not occur. And wow. even if they had a chief, the chief would never be able to like order somebody into battle like Putin is doing. Wow. The chief was more like the mediator, the one who was the best suited to kind of uh, deal with disputes in the in the community, who also had the, the most knowledge of uh, the, the plants and the sacred history, the mythology of the community and so on. Uh, so it was like the wisest person in the community. If they ever got too powerful, actually the, the women, the council of grandmothers would, would, would cut them down and, and they would be um, mm. kind of uh, exiles. Um, if you look at the, uh, the Iroquois constitution, which was very much the basis for the American constitution, I mean, it also enshrined kind of like equality of wealth. So there wasn't supposed to be massive inequalities of wealth. And actually in, in the Iroquois and other Native American societies, the, um, the chiefs or the leaders were actually the ones who possessed the least because uh, they mm. would actually, you know, had all these complicated re reciprocal relationships. They would give their wealth away through potlashes or through gifts. And that was actually a sign of their nobility of spirit. So we've kind of mm. inverted everything where we now associate uh, quality and character with, um, you know, material possession, which is completely the opposite of any, um, you know, intelligent culture. Mm. Mm. Given that that's like what's being so popularized, are, are there any, do you see sort of any movements or any opportunities for, for again, things to shift, to change, to sort of break that mold and, and to, and to really help um, present a, a different model in the popular culture? Uh, it's complicated because um, the, you know, kind of, um, power of technology is more and more serving the interests of the powerful, mm. uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, drones or whether it's surveillance or uh, manipulation of uh, algorithms and so on. So um, at the moment, it feels like people have been more fully um, confused and duped. Mm. Uh, so I'm even less optimistic than I was maybe 10 or 12 years ago. You know, there was, uh, you know, briefly the Occupy movement and so on, but even that wasn't yeah. very well organized or well architected let's say so yeah it's hard to see from where we are now how a uh, alternative movement could gather enough force uh and, and what we're seeing instead is a lot of the rebellious energy being siphoned off into kind of neo-fascism mm. uh, you know with the trumpians and the uh the you know the proud boys and all this nightmare yeah 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 um uh, uh, need to take another break but when we come let's back i want to yeah, um, I, I, I want to um, delve into something that you've started to talk about in, in your blog a bit about how all maybe this crisis is all meant to be sort of an initiatory process for humanity. Okay, That'll be a great. Time. All right. I, I, that one. when I when I saw you start to talk about that, it was like, oh, this is really juicy. This is oh, something cool. to sure. dive into. So yeah. let, let's talk about that. A real quick break. Everyone, please stay tuned. Uh, we'll be right back in just a moment. Are you passionate about the conversation around racism? Hi, I'm Reverend Dr. TLC, host of the Dismantle Racism Show, which airs every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on talkradio.nyc. Join me and my amazing guests as we discuss ways to uncover, dismantle, and eradicate racism. That's Thursdays at 11 o'clock a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a small business trying to navigate the COVID-19 related employment laws? 
Hello, I'm Eric Sauber, employment law business law attorney and host of the new radio show, Employment Law Today. On my show, we'll have guests to discuss the common employment law challenges business owners are facing during these trying times. Tune in on Tuesday evenings from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Hey, everybody, it's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy and Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. And welcome back. Um, Daniel, so uh, we just ended uh, last segment. I wanted to touch upon this really fascinating concept you came up with about how perhaps maybe this, this global crisis that we're facing is actually something that will serve us in the long run should we get through it as terms of it being some kind of an initiatory process. I'm wondering if you could sort of explain that for our audience and, and let's dig into that a little bit. Yeah, Sam, thanks for bringing that up. It's uh, definitely one of my favorite thought streams. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, pre-modern, if you look at all cultures around the world, there was almost always initiatory uh, processes, usually for, you know, adolescents, so young adults, to become a full adult of the community, you had to go through this process. That could involve, you know, fasting, walkabouts, but basically, you know, push you towards visionary experience through some type of intense privation. Uh, Joseph Chilton Pierce is an interesting writer. Wrote the Cosmic Anthropology Transcendence. He proposes that, um, you know, in a way, um, maybe there's some kind of developmental process, uh, even in terms of our neurochemistry, that um, you know requires this kind of initiation. Uh, to reach a kind of level of adult maturity. Uh, and yeah, modern civilization, you know, kind of shifted from initiation to indoctrination. Mm. Uh, we don't go through these types of processes. There's a bar mitzvah, maybe if you're Jewish, but you don't really do anything, you just learn a bunch of, you know, language or whatever. Um, you know, so maybe, um, you know, while we, but, but you know, may, maybe this kind of initiatory threshold is something that uh, we can't evade or escape. And so subconsciously, like we've known about the ecological emergency since the 60s, uh, we haven't really been able to course correct. Maybe we're actually self-willing subconsciously a collective uh, crisis to force a uh, mutation of human consciousness to bring us to uh, a, a more adult stage of cooperation and symbiosis. Uh, another part of the thought stream is um, if you look at uh, the biological evolution, over long periods of time, there's a sort of inevitable movement from competition, domination, domination and aggression to cooperation and symbiosis. So for instance, like a tree, it's a much older species than us. And you know, it, it provides shelter for many, many other species. Um, it's very generative, you know, food sources and everything. And uh, you know, we're still quite a young species. Uh, I mean, you can even look at uh, Lynn Margolis, wrote a book called Microcosmos, where she looks at how um, you know our own bodies are made up of these huge colonies of microorganisms that learned you know, that maybe we're fighting originally and learned how to be symbiotic and cooperative and, and to create more complex structures, which became our organs, like our lungs and heart and all this stuff. So um, yeah, so so maybe we're pushing ourselves to an evolutionary crisis to force a kind of initiatory uh, process and a kind of mutation of human consciousness so we can develop a truly cooperative and symbiotic planetary civilization. Yeah, I, I, I know there are many people who, who study mushrooms who, who are looking at sort of the mycelial network and how um, uh, someone was stating how like it's a truly 
um, decentralized sort of process where um, the way a mycelial network functions, it, it, it's very symbiotic with the environment around it. And also it, it's constantly popping up and there's no one sort of hierarchy to it. Yeah, I think I wrote about that in one of my recent pieces. There's a really wonderful book by this guy, Merlin Sheldrake, called Entangled Life. Mm. Utterly recommend it, uh, along with Paul Stamets' work on, on mycelial networks. Yeah, yeah and actually, like, um, you know, the internet itself uh, developed in the you know, 60s because of the uh, concerns about nuclear war and how that could lead to a dismantling of our capacity to communicate and so on. So they felt they needed to build a decentralized uh, network sort of like, um, almost like it's almost biomimicry, like following the model of, uh, you know, mycelial networks and so on. So yeah, I mean, um, I think that's all very interesting. Like, like maybe, um, um, you know, this sort of uh, egoic, uh, hyper-individuated condition that we're in now gives way to something that, uh, you know, we understand our subjectivity a little differently. Uh, we, um, we live in communities in a more embedded way again. Uh, and uh, we, you know, take care of those things that are primary, um, you know, for us, for, for life itself, you know, like, you know, biodiversity, uh, health of ecosystems, you know, wetlands and all of that stuff. Um, you know, that, that, that's a possible trajectory. And then our, then our technologies would actually be servants for us in uh, how to, you know, uh, evolve our own consciousness and how to create a harmonic uh, planetary uh, culture. Mm -hmm. One of the things you you also write about, you, you tend to write about a lot of things sort of on the edge. Um, you, you write about crop circles and, and extra, extraterrestrials. Um, it, sometimes to me, it feels like certain communities, certain people kind of feel like they're waiting for the flying sources to land and save us from ourselves in a way. But it doesn't really seem like that's going to happen, is it? Uh, probably not like that. I mean, um, you know, my experiences in all sorts of psychedelic states, including ayahuasca mm -hmm. and DMT, dimethyltryptamine, you know, indicate that there are, I mean, to me, I'm sort of convinced that there are other dimensions, other forms of consciousness, uh, some of it benevolent, some of it malevolent, like basically a whole ecology of uh, sentience mm -hmm. that uh, we don't really understand as of yet. And so, for instance, my, my theory is that, you know, some of the crop circles are um, kind of uh, messages to us from other types of consciousness, you know, in the galaxy that um, are pointing towards kind of an integration of uh, Neolithic and shamanic uh, knowledge systems with modern technologies um, yeah. or science, uh, fractal math, for instance, and so on. I see you have the, the seed of life behind you yes. uh, framing your head perfectly. Um, so yeah, so, so, um, uh, that's all very interesting. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I don't think it's a question of, I mean, the, you know, there, there may certainly be other, other forms of consciousness, uh, whether they're flying around in saucers or whether they're in other dimensions that are observing and, 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 you know, you know, playing with us maybe, uh, um, um, but, um, it's, it's really when we, when we go through an evolutionary stage, maybe that becomes more apparent to us, like how we can work with those other forms of consciousness. Right, right, right. Um, this kind of a, a disturbing trend uh, among people who really believe that like technology is going to save us of of sort of the, the this idea of um, implants, you know, uh, cybernetic implants of, 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 using artificial intelligence, like to keep up with artificial intelligence, we're going to need to augment ourselves, kind of almost taking us away from our natural evolution to, to sort of a more unnatural evolution. Do you share concerns about that? Yeah, but I've written about that a lot. I mean, you're talking about the, the singularity or transhumanism. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think a lot of that is, is, is very problematic. Um, uh, however, I'm not a Luddite. Like I think, I think that we should be using technology. A book that I really loved um, is called uh, by this guy Tom Roberts called "The Psychedelic Future of the Mind," mm -hmm. and he argues that we kind of you know rethink the direction of progress toward actually consciousness, like the many different types of body mind state experiences that we can have, mm -hmm. and, and it seems that they almost have different types of state specific knowledge that we can access in these different you know altered states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So 
I feel that that's really a more interesting direction for our you know future evolution than yeah putting chips in our brains or trying to become immortal through um kind of uploading our consciousnesses to computers mm. silicon silicon matrices you know yeah 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 and the big question is whether ai can become conscious in itself Sentient. or whether whether there's something in our metabolic processes that actually consciousness you know requires uh kind of a metabolic systems you know that, mm. that it's not really going to be the same through a mechanized uh, interface yeah it, it's a conversation i've had with people in the past and just just recently talking to someone about it about our brains like you know there was this um, uh, um belief before that our brains generate consciousness and and there's a different kind of theory now about our brains being a receiver of consciousness like consciousness is actually something outside of the physical organ of the brain or the body but that the brain is sort of an an antenna that's receiving the consciousness from outside of us yeah that's what i i think is the case and and even beyond that i mean i'm, I'm an idealist in a way like i believe i mean i'm very excited by this philosopher bernardo castro who wrote a book called uh, why materialism is baloney Mm. Uh, and he was actually a scientist who was working at CERN uh, and um, went through a kind of self-interrogation process and ended up realizing that it was, you know, a much more probable hypothesis that actually consciousness is the sort of the ontological primitive, the foundation, uh, rather than matter. So it's not that our consciousness, you know, just appears through kind of uh, accidental processes of physical evolution. It's more like... Um, Consciousness is the underlying ground and uh, to, you know, know itself, to explore itself, to investigate itself, it ultimately has to create, um, you know, kind of separated beings like ourselves, which possess, you know, which can, which can hold a certain frequency of consciousness and, and um, you know, kind of, kind of participate in the evolution of consciousness and the evolution of awareness. Which in some ways is what ancient uh spiritual traditions have been saying for it thousands is. of years yeah i mean i'm I'm a huge supporter of vedanta indo-tibetan buddhism uh i mean um i think that um yeah i mean i recently i spoke to a, a, a lama i happened to meet in abisa and i was just once again just blown away by like just the, the clarity and the wisdom and also the matter of factness with which they understand things like reincarnation and um mm. you know, nirvana and other states of consciousness and so on yeah, I feel like it's uh, you know we should we have a lot to learn from uh, cultures like that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, I know you're going to cringe, but one last break, yeah. and then we're going to come back. We'll take, we'll take another uh, break. Uh, we'll take a break, and when we come back, uh, um, I want to just touch upon uh, whether you are hopeful or not hopeful, and and uh, maybe prognosticate a little bit about what we think is going to happen in the next 20, 30, 50 years for humanity. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So everyone, please stay tuned. You're listening to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. We've been speaking this hour with Daniel Pinchbeck, author of such books as How Soon Is Now, Afterlife, and When Plants Dream. And we'll be right back in just a moment. Hey, everybody. It's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy and Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. In a post-COVID world, you may have many unanswered questions regarding your health. Are you looking to live a healthier lifestyle? Do you have a desire to learn more about mental health and enhance your quality of life? Or do you just want to participate in self-understanding and awareness? I'm Frank R. Harrison, host of Frank About Health, and each Thursday, I will tackle these questions and work to enlighten you. Tune in every Thursday at 5 p.m. on talkradio.nyc, and I will be Frank About Health to advocate for all of us. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? 
I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant, and on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Welcome back to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. Um, so, Daniel, the, the, just one more thing I want to touch upon before we get to the future, actually, was um, in, in one of your blogs recently, you had referenced a gentleman, I watched the video, who was talking about how to describe sort of higher states of consciousness, like like what happens when uh, you're on high doses of, of DMT. And, and he was talking about how there's like more and more information being sort of folded into space and and time and and it it i thought it was really fascinating especially in context of what we were talking about before about are there these other dimensions of higher uh, uh, uh states of consciousness that might be really um just packed with so much information that it takes these kinds of 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 symbols and 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 patterns to really uh, 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 represent that dense amount of information. Well, first of all, Sam, I'm, I'm you know I'm nice talking to you because it's clear that you've really been paying attention to my to my stuff, and it's cool to to get you know they have that reflection. Um, yeah, this is this guy Andres from the Qualia Foundation who um, has been doing this extraordinary kind of phenomenological and kind of mathematical s- study of the um, kind of different geometrical structures that you that you enter into at these different uh, levels of DMT intensity, and he talks about hyperbolic, you know, geometries and um, mm-hmm. kind of how space time kind of functions differently within them, and how you know the, these lead to different you know kind of uh, Yes, you kind know, of potential to access different levels of like state specific knowledge and so on. Yeah, I think he's really. Um, I just met him a few months ago in in England at this conference in Yorkshire, and I definitely think he's at the cutting edge of the cutting edge at the moment. And he's also quite funny and giggles all the time, which is always a good sign. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's super fascinating stuff. Um, I don't know what else to say about it, but uh, people can check it out. You know? I, I mean, it, it to me it's kind of interesting because when I think about some of the spiritual teachers I've studied with who've talked about, you know, sort of higher spiritual beings and how, like, in their consciousness, they're able to overlight, like, solar systems and galaxies and and the presence to be able to um, be aware of, like, so much more information. And it felt like this is kind of like the scientific mathematical approach to sort of that spiritual concept. I think he's onto something. He's onto something big. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> maybe absolutely. bigger than maybe bigger than Bitcoin. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, yeah, I sure hope so. So I, I mean, I do know some people who are like hardcore technologists who believe like technology is gonna save us from from our our challenges that we'll we'll come up with some kind of technology technological solution to get enough CO2 out of the air or 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 some other kind of thing. How are you feeling about the future right now? Because you you read so much, you're aware of so much. Uh, I, I, I'm I'm sure you've been through processes and highs of lows of being optimistic and being less optimistic or or pessimistic. How are you feeling today? Are you feeling more optimistic, more pessimistic, or or something in between? Uh, well, uh, today I've been, you know, just last weekend I was rereading and I wrote a little bit about Nisargadatta. Do you know that book, I Am That? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, on some level that's where I'm at. You know, like, you know, there's, you know, everything is perfect as it is, like samsara is nirvana. This is just the unfolding perfection, um, you know, everything, you know, so 
Um, it's incredible. I mean, I think we we don't, you know, reckon enough with the miracle of the fact that you know we're just here. I mean, how did the, the, this happen? There's like a huge fireball, like 92 million miles away, and that's like creating enough heat so that over like billions of years, this strange little globe starts to develop all these like you know processes like photosynthesis and you know oxygen oxygen breathing and all that stuff and then suddenly we're like sitting in cities and talking on zoom i mean for me there's you know the whole thing is kind of a magic uh, play you know like a spectacle yeah. uh, i think that you know our free will is less than what we think it is in this circumstance like we can you know on some level it's all just kind of like happening and we're just part of this uh, process in a way mm. uh, so yeah i mean when i you know ultimately in some level i feel it's not even just hopeful. Like I feel that, you know, the underlying, you know, basis of this reality is this consciousness that is us, that is infinite, infinite love and benevolence and is exploring, you know, its different uh, capacities, you know, through us and into further circumstances that we can't even imagine at this point, just as a, you know, a, a, a monkey couldn't imagine how the, our society developed. Mm. Um, so yes, yeah, so that I think, I mean, I think that actually the more you can relax into that and surrender into having like a no fear kind of perspective, then maybe transformation, you know, does become possible. Like we don't know what's going to happen in five, 20 years. I mean, this guy, Sam Beckman fried was suddenly worth $26 billion. Now he's worth, you know, negative $2, you know? So, yeah. you know, at any moment, we don't know what's going to happen. It's all just kind of happening. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 at least I believe in my experiences that miracles do happen. Um, we may not recognize them all the time, but that miracles can happen and do happen all the time. Um, it, it, I had a thought and it escapes me for the moment. Um, oh, what I wanted to mention was I, I tried for the first time the 5-MeO-DMT uh, earlier this year on my 60th birthday. And it was such an experience of you know what's typically termed the ego death when you feel like you're connected to everything and you have all this awareness and i just remember coming out of it feeling like oh my god if this is what we go back to after we die what is everybody so afraid of and and it felt like very liberating to kind of say like there's nothing to be scared of about death Yet, you know, there's so much in society, there's so much fear around death, we don't even talk about it most of the time. I've, I've actually been having some conversations lately with some people around death, just because of, of parents having passed and stuff. But it's really quite interesting that, that it feels like we're starting to come to terms with death in a way that in modern society, we haven't come to terms with before. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think you know five of me is is a is a very powerful tool, uh, and um, you know it can also be very. I mean, I'm very happy that you had a, a beautiful experience. For some people, it's very jarring. Yeah, uh, I think it's the you know the the loss of you know separate self identity or ego identity. If you're holding on to that very tightly, that's that's a very difficult uh, thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, basically, it, you know, for me, five meo DMT was you know direct uh, confirmation of what uh you know buddhism talks about as nirvana or the void or non-duality uh you, you know it you know visually it's a little bit like islamic kind of patterning on mosques but it's going mm -hmm. off in all directions forever it's continuously moving and you are that you know you're not separate from that until until you start to come out of it then right. you, you, your ego begins to you know reassert itself or, or your capacity to have a separate you know cognition uh and then you're like whoa you know what the hell um so yeah i think it's it, it, it you're right i mean you know that's like you know if you look at you know buddhism their whole idea is um you know by going through lifelong meditation uh you realization you know you can reach a point where you're going to become a non-returner so you no longer you know, you 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 know that's probably the white light of the void is, is just to mm -hmm. dissolve into that into that infinite bliss state um however if it, if, it, if any part of you is clinging to separate identity uh, then you're going to return and, uh, you know, then there are all sorts of levels to which you can return, um, you know, as a, you know, bodhisattva, if you take that kind of bodhisattva vow to help mm -hmm. the liberation of all the suffering beings and all that stuff. 
but yeah, I mean, I think it's incredibly interesting that as we approach this kind of evolutionary cul-de-sac as a species, we have uh, tools like ayahuasca and uh, bufo or 5-MeO, which um, you know can give us this um, kind of talisman of awakening uh, and, and remind us that uh, you know these these, these uh, ancient uh, mystical ideas are completely true and actually more true than uh, a lot of the what we, what we think is true. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> it, it's funny. I just had a discussion yesterday with someone who's a uh, works for NASA. She, she's, um, uh, you know, wor works in one of the departments working on the future Artemis launches and, and a very spiritual person comes from Afghanistan originally. Now I'm going to have her on the show in the summertime, but, but I just find it fascinating that the more that I talk to people who understand quantum physics, who understand like the, the really leading edge of science, that it seems to all be folding back into sort of this ancient mystical view of reality and and that to me yeah it's exciting uh by the way since i see we only have one minute to end i got a little yeah. note on the thing here i just want to mention that uh, the, my main creative outlet right now is my newsletter mm -hmm. so if people are interested in in the sort of uh, following up on these ideas and continuing with them uh, it's danielpinchbeck.substack.com mm -hmm. and um yeah i mean there's a there's a paid level and a free level of subscription but i try to give a lot of content for the free subscription and uh yeah it seems like it's having an effect on you as you seem to be quoting them so hopefully other people will join it also <laughs> yes i i actually uh, mention you to a lot of my friends and stuff and what i've learned and also just if people want to just learn a little bit more about you and your books what's your website uh the website is uh pinchbeck.io okay. and also i have a course platform which is liminal.news i do like a writing class and other lectures and different topics uh and then the books are breaking open the head 2012, The Return of Quetzalcoatl, How Soon Is Now, When Plants Dream, Afterlife, uh, The Occult Control System, uh, and a few others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Daniel. And and we'll have links to all that in, in the show notes. Um, and I also see that my loyal listeners, Patty, Sanaya, William, they're all on the on the YouTube live going like, I have to rewatch this. I'm like taking notes. I can't write this I've, the problem when you have too much information, you know, to share, it's like, yeah. what do you do? You know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, well, Daniel, it's been wonderful to reconnect. Thank, Thank you, you, Sam, so much for taking very time cool, out of your busy time. schedule really to come it. on. Really good. I like your uh, your your seat of life uh, framing there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I get a lot of good comments on it. And and please keep up the good work. Keep up the deep thought and the and the critical analysis of, of where we are. I enjoy it a lot and I, I try and spread it as much as I can. That's very sweet. Thanks so much. All right. You got it. And thank you, my loyal listeners, for tuning in. Don't forget, if you missed any part of the show, you can always catch the replay on YouTube, on talkradio.nyc, and we're on all the podcasting platforms. Apple, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, anywhere you find podcasts, you'll find us. Take care. We will talk to you. Oh, actually, we won't be talking to you next week because it's Thanksgiving, um, but we'll talk to you the week after next. Take care, everyone. Ciao, ciao.